I intend to continue on with these identifying marks of the Lord's Church. I hope you'll remember that we hope to take all of these and put them together when we're finished with these studies into a CD that can be given to people and hopefully help them understand the New Testament church. Interesting that we just sung about the marvelous grace of Jesus. We need to understand more of what the Bible teaches about that and just how that works. But the grace of God, according to Paul, reaches us through the righteousness of God. Now the righteousness of God for us today is the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is God's power to save. And since nobody is going to be saved apart from the favor that we don't deserve, that is the grace of God, then of course there has to be a way that that grace reaches us. And Paul makes that clear in Romans chapter 5 and the last verse when he says that as sin hath reigned or ruled unto death, the end of being death, separation from God, Romans 6, 23, even so my grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, since he cannot be talking about the law of Moses, for by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, as he wrote. And he wrote also, as I said earlier, that the gospel is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1, 16 then it must be that the grace of God reaches us through the power of God to save us, which is the gospel message. And if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, you will see that he talks about that and reminding the Corinthians what they had been taught, what they believed, and what continued to sustain them spiritually. Yet we find that, as is true of anything the Bible teaches, that the devil, through his agents on earth, through unbelief in men, have taught doctrines that are foreign to the grace of God, one of them being that, well, one is saved by belief only, without any acts of obedience. And, of course, that, they claim, puts you into the grace of God. That if you do anything else, then you're not depending on the favor or grace of God that no man can merit. But then on the other side, there is the doctrine that says once you are in the grace of God, once you're in the favor of God, then you cannot ever lose that favor. We usually think of that doctrine as the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Or the doctrine of the impossibility of apostasy. Now, if you're in a congregation and it has Church of Christ on the sign out front or mark here or above the door, and it teaches that you're once saved and always saved, then you're in a church teaching error, and that church itself, they all believe it, of course, then each one who does believe it would be in error. They would be in need of being converted. If you look at Paul's writings, he makes it very clear that we are to be mindful of the people who are overtaking a trespass. He says, you which are spiritual restores such a one the spirit of me. I didn't say they have to deny God and Christ and the whole Bible is the word of God before they fall into grace. It just says they're overtaken in a trespass, so as the King James says, in the fall. Thus, he's talking about things necessary to one remaining faithful. God. When a person violates an obligation as a child of God that's necessary for that person to remain faithful to God, the faithful members are obligated, according to Galatians 6, 1 and 2, to restore that one in the spirit of meekness, considering ourselves, lest we also be tempted. So we must be mindful that people can so sin as to be eternally lost. For if they are not lost or separated from God, to what are you restoring them? If they're all right in the shape they're in, being overtaken in a trespass, then what are you going to restore them to? So I would like today to note that one of the marks of the Lord's church is it teaches the truth on salvation, not only by grace through an obedient faith, by the gospel terms of salvation, 
and each person believing and obeying them, being baptized into Christ for the remission of sin. But it also teaches that one can fall from grace so as to be eternally lost. Now, it ought to be understood and outset. We're not saying one must fall from grace. We're saying that one can, one is able. It's possible for such to happen. And the Bible then deals with that reality, but also, as I said earlier, deals with the faithful restoring such a one to his first love. So the Bible teaches that a child of God can so fall from grace as to be eternally lost if they die in that shape at a devil's hell. Now let's first of all emphasize, and I will be dividing this sermon up uh, to finish it this afternoon, Lord willing. There are things for children of God, for citizens of the kingdom of heaven, for Christians, members of the body of Christ, to believe and do that are peculiar to being faithful to God. That is, to keep from falling from grace. Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, Wherefore, brethren, give the more diligence to make your calling and election <coughs> sure. Now, what use are those words, and what do they mean if it's impossible for a child of God to so sin to be lost? Notice what he says. For if you do these things, ye will never stumble or fall. So he says, if you do these things, you won't fall. What does that imply? You don't do these things, and guess what? You will fall. So what do those words mean since he wrote them to Christians? If it doesn't mean you can get caught up in a sin or totally apostatize and thus lose your salvation. So there are a number of things when he says do these things that are involved. We can't take the time to go to all of them. It would certainly have to do with Bible study, scriptural prayer, but have to do with believing our lives and loving our neighbors and all the details of that, but have to do with worshiping properly, have to do with proper fellowship, and on and on you could go. Well, are these things addressed in the scriptures? Certainly they are. And thus, we can learn, as the Holy Spirit through Peter the Apostle commanded, to do these things so we'll never fall. So the Christian's election is evidently not sure in the sense that, well, I'm baptized for the remission of sin. The Lord had me to the church. I can just go in and pay no attention much to anything anymore. I'm all right. I've often said the Baptists are noted for teaching, once they have always say, and members of the church are noted, many of them, not all of them, for living. So sometimes we must be mindful that once you have obeyed the gospel, and being baptized into Christ, you've just been born of water and the Spirit. You're a babe in Christ. The Bible has much to say about one developing and growing to maturity in Christ. Well, that takes some study. It takes some understanding. Or you wouldn't have such statements like study to show thyself approved to God. A workman that he did not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, Second Timothy Or Paul saying to those who were on the road to apostasy, in the, or say Paul did, and uh, the inspired writer of Hebrews made it clear that, that you're in a condition of having need to be taught again the first principles of the oracles of God. When you have plenty of time to where you should best be on that. And you're not ready for the more meteor matters of mature Christianity. You have to go back and learn the fundamentals once again. Well, they're brethren like that. And if they stay like that, they won't remain in just that first principle state. They'll end up walking away from the whole thing. And brethren, that's what the Jewish Christians for whom the letter the Hebrews was written were in the process of doing. Now, the Corinthian Christians were admonished to take heed lest they fall. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. So, the simple question is, if one cannot fall, then why are we taught to take heed lest we fall? If you knew it were absolutely impossible for some man on a building to fall, absolutely impossible, then you would say to him, well, take heed lest you fall. Because you would know it was impossible for that person to fall. Paul knew it was possible for him to be rejected. Now, you think poor man Paul was in service to God. Yet, as long as you're in the flesh on this earth, you think the devil's going to leave you alone? What is one of the best ways to draw the devil's attention to you personally? 
It will be what most of the world's not. The great, great majority of the world's not. A faithful servant of God wearing the name Christian rightly and honestly because it means what you know Christ. So when you decide to obey the gospel, you're immediately drawing Satan's attention to you. And thus it means that we must stay as close as possible to the truth and as honest we can in applying it. <coughs> That's how you're going to enjoy the grace that we sang about a moment ago. We're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into God's favor. He favors us. That doesn't mean we deserve it. No, He favors us. We don't deserve anything but eternal damnation. So He favors us. Thus you're in a position not to see how much of the world you can continue to live here. But you're in a position in that favored state to advance because you know the blood of Christ is cleansing you. You're always going forward in greater knowledge and practice of the truth. You're always willing to turn against anything you see in your life that's wrong. That is being faithful and the blood of Jesus Christ will continue to cleanse you from your sin. First John 1 verse 7. That's how the grace of God works for the member of the church who is faithful to it. But that does not mean that you can just throw up your hands. Notice Paul wrote part of the book of Romans. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace, God's favor, may abound? Notice what his answer is. God forbid. May it never be so. In other words, when you were baptized, you had repented of your sins. You had died in your mind to the practice of sin. And you were buried as a dead man in the baptism. You were raised to walk in newness of life. You're a new creature in Christ. Well, what does that mean? That you're never going to sin again? No. It means that you're headed for heaven and the only way you can do that is by pursuance of heaven through the knowledge of the truth that you study daily and put into practice. In fact, a part of the system of grace is to confess our sins one to another. That's part of it. Well, you couldn't do that if you hadn't been baptized into Christ. You're still in your old lady in sin. So the grace of God allows us to press on. It's not written to the person who throws up his hand and quit and say, well, I'll be saved anyway because I'm in the grace of God. It's written to the person who pushes on. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's the person that God's grace blesses. The member of the church who doesn't quit, who's always examining himself. Examine yourself to do whether you be in the faith. So Paul knew it was possible for him to be rejected. And he even said in uh, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27 that he buffeted his body and brought it into subjection or bondage. That is, self-control was involved. Lest by any means, after I have preached to others, I myself am a castaway, or as the American Standard says, should be rejected. Now, why would he say that if it wasn't possible for one as advanced in biblical knowledge and practice as Paul? As loyal as a person could be. Why would he say that? Because he had the will to keep on keeping on. I think, from personal experience, in preaching the gospel so long, that probably one of the greatest dangers any one of us faces, no matter how dedicated to God we are, as we ought to be, is that you get time to fight. Now think about that for a minute. But yet the Bible's full of material that says as long as you're on this earth, you're going to be attacked in the way Satan attacks anybody. But it's easy to say, I've done my part. Why must I do this again? Will this ever end? Where's your knowledge of the Bible? What good is it with what you know? Yes, it will always be that way. Unless you lose your mind completely and you won't know the difference anyway, you won't be responsible. But as long as we're responsible for our thoughts and words and actions, then as members of the church and all that that means. Yes, we have to be vigilant in the examination of ourselves and doing those things necessary to remain faithful. Now, a child of God can quit believing. It's not going to happen just overnight. You don't find a strong, faithful Christian today and totally apostate tomorrow. But it's one little step at a time that begins to eat at faith. You think of termites in a house. Now think of how one termite, one single solitary termite, can't be very much. You say, well, you eat all they can eat. Yeah, well, that's still not very much. But you get a bunch of them eating a little bit, 
Next thing you know, they've destroyed a house. Take heed, brethren, lest happily there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God. Hebrews 3.12. I, I do not know what people do with the Word of God in these passages when they still say, well, a child of God cannot so sin as be totally lost. What good are these words? It just simply encourages us, exhorts us, admonishes us, and even in many cases rebukes us when we tend to fall away from Bible study, being concerned about the brethren as the Bible teaches we should be, and doing those things Christians do then we have to, if you please, get on to ourselves. You ever given yourself a sermon? Have you ever uh, rebuked yourself? Well, I think there's something terribly wrong with a person's faith when you can say, well, I don't know that I've ever had to rebuke myself for my thoughts, words, and actions. Well, you're already gone. You need to repent of that because the devil already hates you. The Galatians, as you know, we're taught that a Christian can fall from grace. We notice that in the reading this morning. Whosoever you are that are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. They had the problem with the Judaizing teachers. Galatians chapter 1. This passage came from Galatians 5 4. Judaizing teachers said to Gentiles, Yeah, you obey the gospel, but then you must be circumcised to keep the law. That's just necessary. And if uh, somebody believed that, then Paul said, You're already fallen from grace. It's not a matter of whether you will. If you're looking for justification that way in the eyes of God, you are fallen from God's faith. You're out of God's faith. So we must understand then that as long as we are responsible for our thinking and our actions, then we have a responsibility to examine ourselves. We know from Ephesians 2 and verse 8, and it's that wonderful song a while ago told us, that we are saved by God's grace, Ephesians 2 8. But see, also, we know that we can fall from grace, Galatians 5, 4. So I can only conclude that a Christian may be lost because he falls from grace. Also, a Christian can so sin to be eternally lost because he can go, he can so sin, he can so engage in the transgression of God's law, sins of omission or commission, as to be in a worse condition than he was before he became or she became a Christian. Now we have Peter, we have Peter addressing that in his second epistle in chapter 2, verses 20 and, uh, through 22. He says it this way. Now remind you, he's writing to members of the church. They heard the same gospel we've heard. They believed and obeyed it. Believe, repent, confess, be baptized. They've done that. They assembled as the Bible requires of them to assemble on the first day of the week, engage in the act of worship. All these things. But look what Peter says to them. For if, after they've escaped the pollutions or defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I emphasize this here, notice you escape those things through the knowledge of Christ. Without the knowledge of Christ, you can't escape them. They are again entangled therein and overcome. So involved in them, their faith is overcome. Their faith is overthrown. They're now back in the world as far as their actions. Well, what is their state? He says, the last state is worse for them than the first. For it were better for them that they had known the way of righteousness, they had known the gospel, than after knowing it, to turn back into the bigger the elements of the world, uh, then that's worse than ever. Well, how does he describe it being worse than that? It's happened unto them according to the fruit of the earth. The dog turning his own bottom again, and the sound that was washed for a while in the mire. What is God's viewpoint of a child of God who has fallen from grace? I can't get plainer than that. It's worse than a sick dog eating what made him sick in the first place, and a sow that was cleaned up and went right back to the mud. Yet this person did it by rejecting what he knew that caused him to obey the gospel in the first place. That's why it'd be better he never obey the gospel. He spurned now the truth he lived for a while. So they had escaped the violence of the world, but they're again entangled therein and overcome. And that's the reason the last stage is worse than the first. I think that one verse, if nothing else besides the others, would say, yes, as a member of the church, 
baptized to Christ, alien sins remitted, added to the church by the Lord, covered by the blood of Christ. If you don't keep yourself clean by following the truth and bond of being faithful, then you can fall from grace. If not, these, these don't make any sense at all. The parable of the sower also plainly refutes the doctrine of the impossibility of apostasy. You can find that account in Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 through 8, also 18 through 23, and in Luke 8, verses 4 through 15. Now, who is the sower? Will you be anybody sowing the seed of the kingdom, preaching the word of God, teaching the truth? Paul said, preach the word. Luke uh, 11 said, the word uh, is the seed of the kingdom. So the sower is the gospel preaching, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. The soil is the human heart, according to Luke 8, verse 15. And that person is honest in the reception of the truth that's preached to him and makes the proper application of it. That's the reason that having an honest and good heart is just uh, a must. The wayside here did not become a Christian. The stony ground here represents those who accepted the word, but they withered away because of tribulation, persecution, and temptation in some way or another. They couldn't stand it. Matthew 13, 20 and 21, and Luke 8, verse 13. They became Christians, but they failed to produce fruit, which is another way of saying they ceased to be faithful. And thus their appointed lot is recorded in Matthew chapter 19, or 7, and verse 19. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And going on with what is said in the parable of the uh, sower, we have the idea that the thorny ground, the thorny ground, represents those who became Christians but were choked by the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, or the pleasures of this life. And they too became unfruitful. Matthew 13, 22 and Luke 8, 14. They accepted the, war, the gospel of Christ. They accepted the word. They believed it. They obeyed it. The affairs of this world in some way or the other pulled them back and they fell from grace. The parable of the vine and the branches is more proof that a branch in the vine a Christian can be burned. Listen to what is said in John 15, verses 2 through 6. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh it away. And every branch that beareth fruit, then he cleanses it. Why? Well, he goes ahead and tells us that it may bear more fruit. Now notice the branches of man, because later in there he says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And they gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now what message do you get from that as a child of God? Well, if it doesn't say, I must remain faithful, why would we have 1 Corinthians 58 and uh, verse 58? 15 verse 58, if, if it wasn't for the fact that we need somebody to tell us, don't get dejected, don't get down in the dumps, or whatever you want to call it, but you just keep doing what you've always known is right. But many times we let the affairs of this world, like Peter when he looked around at all the waves of the sea, he's walking on the water, he took his eyes off Christ, and he began to sink. But well, he's the same Peter, he's on the same water, but he stopped looking at Christ. Every branch in me declares Jesus himself. Notice, in me. Well, you don't get into Christ except you're baptized into Christ. So he says every branch in me, a Christian. Then what happens? Well, if he ceases to abide in the branch as his own choice, he's a free moral agent before he became a Christian and after he became a Christian. That does away with the idea of the Baptist doctrine. What if he falls away and was in the first place? Paul Christ said he was in. Is it a man in me? Well, I'm taught in Galatians 3, 26-27 that I'm baptized into Christ. That's how I put on Christ. So Christ says, in me. Does that to be a member of the church that he speaks of, even though the church at this time was not established and was out ahead 
in history. So it's just ridiculous to say that somebody in me is not really a Christian. But the only people who are in Christ are Christians. We learn from the parable of the talents that a servant of the Lord can be lost. Matthew 24, 14 through 30. Very quickly we'll go over this. First of all, the persons under consideration are the Lord's own servants. Not people who are not his servants, but his servants. A servant is one who does the will of another. So these are his own servants. The next point is, two were faithful and they were blessed because of their faithful servitude. One was in love. Weak and slothful. Now, how did the Lord treat him? Well, the Lord treated him by saying he ought to be cast into the outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, what can we conclude from this? Well, that one of the Lord's own servants can be eternally lost. If that, again, as I said several times already, is not the burden of the message of this, what would it be? Jesus said that he would gather certain ones out of his kingdom and cast them into the furnace of fire. Matthew 13, 41 and 42. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels that shall gather out of his kingdom all things that cause stumbling and them that do iniquity and shall cast them into the furnace of fire and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we need to be vigilant. Well, what does it mean? Because it sounds like, well, I, I take the next step, I'm going to be gone. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It's just it can, teaches that you can, if you're not careful, fall from grace. What did we say in the beginning? You press on. You're habitually doing God's will. You're striving to do the truth. Will you make mistakes while you do this? Of course you do. But you're headed the right direction down the straight and narrow way that's hemmed in all sides by the authority of the Lord and the gospel. That's the difference. There, there's a big difference in somebody striving to do the best they can honestly and making mistakes and somebody not caring at all. We recognize that in about everything that we do. And most people recognize the person that's really trying, that really got his heart in it. And that's the one in the church, the Christian, who has the blessed blood of Christ continually cleansing. Because they're willing to do, and every time they see that they're not going to change, they keep a penitent attitude. They keep a realization that they can fall, but they strive trusting in Christ and the favor they have in the body of Christ. It's far cry different from those in dress as having fallen or in the process of falling. This gives them a license to the person who says, well, I know that's wrong, I'm going to do it anyway. I know that's wrong, I, or I don't care, or what's the big deal the preacher's making out of this? I'm covered by the blood of Christ. I'm in his grace. That kind of nonchalant, uh, shallow attitude is the one that is going to fall. The old Christian is striving with all the power they have to learn and do the will of God. After all, the church is the spiritual body of Christ, and we are members in particular. And our various roles faithful to the Lord, then the work of the Lord gets done. Folks, if you remove the church of our Lord, as that's defined in the Bible and used in the Bible, from this earth, tell me, aside from the Lord promising the word of God will remain here, tell me who there is that put the truth of gospel into practice to be the salt of the earth, the living for good in the world, to be the light of the world. They're not. So it's the Christian who puts these things into practice. Make mistakes? Of course you will. But there's a big difference to the person who doesn't care, who simply throws his hands up, loves this present world, such as Demas, remember? Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. There's a big difference in that person and the person who makes mistakes and they strive to learn the truth and live it and teach it and defend it and be all it says they ought to be. Now, I will continue this afternoon in our study because I think this proper understanding will call us to see the difference, how we can enjoy the great grace of Christ that we have being in Christ, but knowing exactly what is meant and what it takes to fall from grace and when we can do that.
or in some cases, maybe have been. If you're not a child of God this morning, we studied a moment ago briefly the plan of salvation. As a child of God, we spent time on showing you the importance of walking in the faith that you might continue in the grace of God. Because the grace of God is extended to us, and we abide in by abiding in the truth of God, 1 Corinthians 16, 58. But if you sin, we come to beg of you to repent of those sins and pray God for forgiveness. And why not do so now while you have the time with this dead and sin? Thank <laughs> you.